Shalom Aleichem, hope you're well and healthy. I want to talk today, as we start the month of Adar, Rosh Chodesh Adar, 60 days, two months of Adar, joy, 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 all that stuff. I don't want to talk about joy. I want to talk about something that leads to joy. And something that I believe, well-intentionally, we end up entering the same pit over and over and over, many of us. In short, we often prefer to be right than to be happy. <laughs> okay, punchline done. Over, nothing more to say. There is more to say. Let's, let's explore this. Let's, again, first point out that most people who want to be right, they genuinely, they genuinely feel it's the right thing. In other words, it's the moral thing to be principled. And therefore, for me to compromise on my principles, for me to be bigger than my principles, is ridiculous. And I, especially people who have suffered a complicated life, they often put principles in their life in order to give structure to it. Sometimes there are principles that come outside of faith, and sometimes there are even faith-based principles but they're not coming from a place of health, they're coming from a place of a crutch, coming from a place of structure. I need principles because that's the way it helps me navigate this world because the world is very confusing, the world is very scary because I didn't have a healthy foundation and therefore I become very principled. The problem is then the principles get in the way because we live in a world of humans, not of principles. And yes, principles are good as long as they help you navigate your life. But often principles become a wedge between people because you don't fit my principle. You're not acting in the way that I principally feel you should. And therefore, we're forable. Therefore, there's a cutoff. And that rigidity to principle is very dangerous, very unhealthy, and very counterproductive. And it's often where people who are taking on morality, taking on Yiddishkeit, where they often verge off the beaten path a bit. Why? Because principles are only a manual. They're only a navigation system, but they're not a cage. They're not here to cage in your relationships. They're not here to make you inflexible analogy that I heard from Rabbi Weirich Jacobson, he says, you're playing soccer, you're playing football on a, on a rooftop of a 50-story building. If you don't have a fence around, you won't be able to play ball because you'll be so afraid of falling off. You have a solid fence around you, now you can play ball. But the point is, the fence is just a means to an end. The fence isn't the end. It's not, yay, we have a fence, done. No, we have a fence, and now we can play ball. Often for many people, the principles that they adopt, the laws that they adopt, the Yiddishkeit that they adopt, is there for the sake of rigidity, for the sake of making their life extremely predictable. But this isn't a world of predictable. This isn't a world that you could put your head in the sand and do the ostrich move and say that, well, these are my principles. No, you gotta play ball. Within the principles, okay, but play ball. Some people have no principles, so then their, their game is not a game because there's no, there's no out of bounds. There's no, there's no rules to the game. That's not a soccer game. There's no goalie. There's no, there's no goalpost. There's nothing. It's wild. But the other people are so rigid on the rules that they forget that the rules are only there for, so that life can flourish within it. You know, I'm thinking like the womb is important as long as there's a... a it plays its function, though, when there's a child that's, that's growing in it. In other words, the environment is important as long as something's going on in the environment. If there's just an environment without any life inside of it, if there's just a wall, if there's just a jail, if there's just a, a rigidity without flow, there's nothing. It's like putting up a dam, but there's no water flowing. There's nothing going on. The dam with no water. 
So as we enter a month of joy, it's important to ask yourself a simple question. Do I have joy? Or do I get in my own way? Do I get in my own way from place of sadness? But that's not really the topic of the shear. Over here, it's I get in my own way because I'm not gonna talk to that person based on the way they spoke to me. I'm principled. And I shouldn't forgive this. Otherwise they'll get away with murder. I'm principled. I will not talk to my kid a week now because of how they spoke to me. I'm principled. I will not talk to my wife. I'm principled. Everybody botching up their life on principle. If really, if that's what principle was put into the world to, to make us mess up our lives, to mess up relationships, and relationships by default cannot be too principled. They could have basic principles, but it's two human beings, two frail human beings, so it's impossible for it to be too rigid. If that's what it is, then it's, it's the most destructive force ever. But that's not why Hashem gave us rules. That's not why principles are important. They're just a framework within to work. But if every single part of the relationship said, just, it's like, I used to be that person. So there. <laughs> In other words, when I was younger and like, you know, very self-righteous, the self-righteousness and principles are perfect fit. They're literally one and the same. What do you mean? I'm so righteous. I have these principles. I can't sacrifice on them. I'm so when I was in that stage, it's like it's it's it makes the world so unmaneuverable. It's like trying to drive in a bike lane with a car. You just can't fit. You're bumping into walls all the time. And the reason is because you're supposed to be driving a bike, not a car. It's a narrow lane. So first your mirror gets knocked on this side, then the mirror on that side, then your door starts getting scraped on all sides, et cetera, et cetera. Why? There's nothing wrong with the car. It's just on the wrong road. It's the wrong road for this car. You know, I was hearing a story of recently of somebody who decided, like a few decades ago, he built the first sukkah mobile here in Joburg. It's a big sukkah on the back of a truck. And when they were driving home, they forgot to notice to count how high the how high the sukkah was. And they're driving into the house, and there's this cover on top of the entrance. Bam! Knocks the whole sukkah down. They had to rebuild it from scratch. It's nice to drive a sukkah mobile. Just make sure it fits. It's nice to drive cars. Just make sure it fits. It's nice to have a bull, but make sure you don't bring him to a china shop. But often our principles are literally like a bull in a china shop. They're just smashing. It's just a source of so much pain around us. And it's a personality type. There are just certain people that, that, that for them, Again, I don't know if it's, it's, it's not their bad choice. I think that's maybe the way they're created or that's the way they gravitate to. For them, being right is so important and they'll fight and they'll destroy and they'll cause chaos for their version of right, even if the right is right. And just before I came into the shear, I was doing research for a, a relative of mine on a topic of uh, she, she, someone asked me to get find some quotes. And I just went searching for interesting Jewish quotes. And I came up with, with I, I, this quote showed up, which really deeply resonated with me. It's by the son of the author of the Tanya, Rabbi Dov Ber Lubavitch. And over there, he's talking about the danger of what happens to somebody who wants to be right so much that they destroy relationships. So his statement goes like this. One second. How bad is division? It literally destroys, it eats to the core. It destroys at the core, both ruchnius, both spiritually, and physically. That's what it does. It literally destroys. 
And the vision often doesn't come from two bad people. There are sometimes. The vision comes from two people who feel that their principles are more important than getting along. Now, I'm not saying don't have principles. But I am saying, if you're fighting with more than a handful of people in your life, if you don't talk to more than a handful of people in your life, and it's what they all have in common is principle, you're doing something wrong. Straight up wrong. Yeah, you might be fighting with people who don't like your personality type, that's fine. But if the cause of this division is on principle, I will not talk to that person based on what they need, then either God gave you bad luck and all the people around you are trash, moronic, or it's your principles getting in the way. Stop being so principled. Choose happiness over being right. In marriages, where it's, you know, especially like a marriage is so vulnerable that the guy, often the guy, but the, girl, the woman as well, will often just do anything to fight for their, to be the last voice in the argument because I need to be right. And for me, being right is more important than being happy because my happiness comes from being right. Even if all hell breaks loose and my world goes to, to pieces because my, I am right. I am right. However, we have other role models. We have the patriarchs and matriarchs. We have, we, have Jew, we have the Torah. And we read about Joseph who forgave his brothers for selling him as a slave. And we read about Avram who saves his nephew Lot from Sodom, even though Lot was a total backstabber and a renegade, etc. And we read Moshe who's forgiving the Jewish people over and over and over, even though they've done the greatest sins. So much so he fights with God to save the sinners, those same sinners who caused him endless grief. Because Moshe loved people more than he loved principles. And therefore, when principles got in the way of loving people, he broke the tablets. Why? Because in the tablets it said, thou shall have no other God. So if I break the tablets... And therefore, the contract, the principle is broken. The Jews will no longer be deserving the guilt, the death penalty for serving idols. And I've saved them. In other words, I choose to save people over principle because I love them more than I love my principles. So ask yourself a simple question. Are you happy? And if you're not happy, what's getting in the way? Is it sadness? Is it bad events? Or is your principles getting in your way? I will never forgive that person as long as I live. Why? God forgives you for things much worse than that. No? Imagine you show up on Yom Kippur and you turn to God and say, forgive me. And God says, as long as I live, never. Hashem forgives us for everything. And yet, why can't we give that grace to others? Doesn't mean you have to, again, it doesn't mean you have to love people. It doesn't mean you have to be obsessed with them and spend the rest of your life with them, but forgive them. Genukshin, enough. This principle is making you a miserable person. But Rabbi, if you knew how bad she or he treated me, you're right. But you're not happy. <laughs> If you were happy, then, then, then you wouldn't fight so much. When you're in, the, in, the, in your element, when you're at your happiest moment, your child's under the chuppah, you don't have time for grudges. Somebody who could think of a grudge under the chuppah, under the chuppah of their child, is a really, really broken human being, a really, really compromised human being. That's a real narcissist. Why? Because in moments of joy, we, we, we are bigger than this stuff. Yeah, no, I like, didn't like you. I'm not looking. Party. You know, the famous Tisha B'Av story about the Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. In short, this fellow got the wrong invite. He thought the guy's name was Kamsa, who was supposed to be invited to this party. Instead, they invited Bar Kamsa, the son of Kamsa. Maybe it was his son, who they didn't like. 
And the guy who throws the party throws Bar Kamsa out, even after Bar Kamsa promises to pay for half the party. Now this, then this guy goes to Rome and tattletales on the on the sages who didn't stand up for him. And basically that's one of the reasons the second temple was destroyed. But the first part of the story is even more striking. This guy's holding a party and all he could focus on is the one enemy in the room. We're at a party. You're in a moment of happiness. You're being surrounded by all the big sages and all, everybody's doing hero worship of you. And yet all you can see is that one guy that doesn't belong there. You know, there's a um, piece of Talmud where the Gemara says, everything has to have a source in the five books of Moses, in the Torah. So the story of Purim, which is the month of Adar, and the, the arch villain Haman, Haman Minatur mina Minayin, where does Haman find itself? Where do we see the name Haman? That's what seemingly the fact lands the question is, where does the name Haman exist? And the Talmud answers, when God's calling out to Adam after Adam ate from the tree of knowledge, which he wasn't supposed to, Hashem says, Hamin ha'et sazeh, did you really eat from this tree? Hamin, hey mem nun, is the same letters as Haman. That's the source of the name Haman. But the sages ask, really, I mean, like, first of all, why do you need a source in the same letters? Big deal. Achashverosh is written in the Torah. You didn't find Achashverosh in the Torah. So why do you have to find Haman in the Torah? And also, that's not the only time it says Hamin. So, like, that's the, like, why are you choosing that anecdote? And the, there's a beautiful explanation. What was ha Adam's problem? Adam's problem was that God told him he could eat every tree, but all Adam could think about is that one tree I can't eat from, that tree. Haman was, and the same with Haman. Haman had the whole world bowing down to him, but there was one person that destroyed him. Mordechai wasn't bowing down to him. And that's what caused him to make the decree against the Jews and eventually his own downfall. So comes the Gemara, the Talmud, and says, where do we see this characteristic of Haman, this obsession that if it's not perfect, it's not, I'm not happy? From Adam. Adam had the same issue. All the trees are okay besides that one tree, and I will dafke eat from that. In other words, this idea that sits there saying, it's either the way I want it or I'm not happy, is the Haman attitude. It's the Adam attitude, both very destructive attitudes that don't lead to joy. We don't live in a perfect world. We live in a compromised world. And the goal is to be joyous within imperfection, to be joyous in an imperfect marriage, to be joyous with an imperfect child, and most importantly, to be, jo to be joyous and happy with your imperfect self. For me to be happy knowing, yeah, I'm imperfect. I have huge faults and I'm okay. I have to work on them, but I'm okay being faulty. I wasn't put into this world to be perfect. I'm not perfect, despite what I think my principles make me, it doesn't make me perfect. And the biggest proof that I'm not perfect is that I'm so principled, I'm destroying the world around me. There's nothing perfect about it. And I'm, and, and I'm, not, I'm not living within this world. I'm not living within this world. I saw this insight from the Lubavitcher Rebbe yesterday in a totally different context. I was learning a, a piece of Talmud with, with his insights. And the punchline over there was, only if you're a person in this world can you truly, truly have empathy for somebody else because you realize how complicated this world is. If you're an angel, if you, angels in heaven, they judge people. But if you're a human and you know your own human frailties, then what are you judging? You fail too many times to count. Maybe the other person fails in different ways than I do, than you do. So what? But the, what they have in common is we all fail. So they're failing in stuff that you're principled in, and you're failing in stuff that they're principled in. Mazel tov. Where's the judgment? You're perfect? Really? And if you're perfect, you don't belong amongst us. We're here. We're, we're humans. Sorry, you don't belong here. Human beings, we're all here to be imperfect and do our best. If you're really that perfect, go be an angel. 
as the woman says, my husband is an angel, to which her friend says, you're lucky, mine's still alive. Angels don't belong there. And therefore, we can only have healthy relationships when we just realize, I will not achieve perfection, and neither will that person. And I can learn to live with that person's imperfections instead of convincing myself that the perfect person of my imagination exists there. It doesn't. He doesn't. She doesn't. Oh, people saying, okay, we've dated for four years already, but I'm still looking. What are you looking for to see if she's perfect or he's perfect? They're not. Bam. Wow. Massive revelation. Insight of the day. They are not perfect. They are so imperfect you cannot imagine. And so are you. You are imperfect and I'm imperfect. So, 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 so what are you looking for? To discover their imperfections? Whatever you'll discover now, you'll still discover much more later. And most of the imperfections haven't even revealed itself yet. Wait till you get married and the stresses and babies and children and dust and money. Other weaknesses will show. So therefore what? You deserve perfection? Why? What about you deserve perfection? You really want to marry an angel anyway? Really? How's that going to lead to any happiness to you? What's it going to lead to? Imagine being married to a perfect person when you're imperfect. That's quite intimidating. You want to be married to an angel? No, you want to be married to a human being. So stop looking for perfection. There are certain things you don't compromise on, obviously. Don't allow yourself to get hurt and abused and mistreated and belittled. Fine. But the rest of the stuff, be flexible. Set a few things that are important to you, but no, you have to check every box. And until I don't date them for 18 years and introduce them to every auntie of, me, of mine and get the opinion of every uncle and auntie and cousin for everyone to sit there saying, oh my God, she's perfect for you. Until I don't do that, I don't know. If you're oh, what a miserable way to find somebody. And by the way, what's it telling to that spouse of yours, to that, to, to that boyfriend or girlfriend? What you're saying is, I will not marry you unless you're perfect. You're not good enough for me. Unless everybody says you're good enough for me. How patronizing and arrogant and a bunch of other words that come to my mind. Instead of saying, I'm imperfect, you're imperfect, but the stuff I love about you and the stuff that hopefully you love about me, let's build a home together and we'll figure it out. And we'll choose to be forgiving of each other's imperfections and of our own imperfections. Could you imagine? Like I just look at, at the way we marry, the way we divorce. It's, I'm sorry, it's so unhealthy. Taking forever to make the decision. Then anyways, we discover that they're not great and 50% of people then divorce the spouse that they spent six years dating. Is that really the model? Is that what it is? Instead of saying, I'm imperfect, you're imperfect, we belong together. Instead of saying, you're perfect, you know, you stand every wedding speech, oh, look, look at him, look at her, they're perfect for one another. They're perfectly imperfect for one another, hopefully. Because if they're perfect for one another, that means that there's literally no rough edges. They just fill each other. They plug the hole. They're the perfect fit. All his weaknesses, she compensates. Oh, come on. Life isn't like that. Life isn't perfect. It's not a puzzle. It's, it's like a wall putting together a bunch of little pieces of wood and trying to get out of this hodgepodge some form of, of shape. But it's not like every piece of wood plug. It's not a tiles on the floor. Nobody's square. So we just entered the month of joy. One road to joy that we can do well by adapting is stop being so rigid. Stop being so right. Stop focusing always on being the last one in the argument. We can eat humble pie. 
and be happy. Don't be a victim. But don't, the opposite of a victim isn't right. The opposite of victim is empowerment. And being right all the time is not empowering, it's actually disempowering because it comes from a low self-esteem. An empowered person is comfortable being wrong. If you're uncomfortable being wrong, you're not empowered. You're a true victim because you're a victim of your own circumstances and you're a victim of your principles which are getting in your way. So don't be a victim. Be empowered. L'chaim, to joy, to happiness, to good relationships between faulty, compromised human beings. L'chaim.